I'm Scott L. Miller, and this is my everyday life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, just for fun, I have bronchitis. Yes, you can probably hear it in my voice. I'm always a little bit low, but I'm a little bit more raspy than usual. So I apologize for the sound. I just woke up this morning and realized that that's what I had. So I'm going to be getting some antibiotics later today. Today, we're going to be answering some viewer questions. Three, in fact. One, about finding a place on the beach. Two, uh, about buying a house and finding a way to fit into society for someone who was born here but has not lived here most of their life and three a little bit more about how to use sim cards and and uh, international calling plans because this stuff is pretty confusing and everyone has a slightly different situation so we're going to get to all that right after the buck I want to thank everyone for putting up with one, my raspy bronchitis voice, and two, for doing these indoor videos. I am still making videos just before we head off to Argentina. And so because of that, uh, I am working really hard to have a backlog of videos that, uh, so you guys don't miss a day, right? Really, I don't miss a day, and you guys have something to watch every day. So I'm working very hard on that, and it has been a little bit exhausting. I also want some feedback. What do you think of this setup? This is where I'm actually filming right against the window. So this is all natural light that I do during the day, and you can see my my uh, studio light for the live stream right behind me. And this one I move around uh, just kind of gives this little bit of, you're supposed to have a hair light. I don't know. I don't have hair, so I don't know why it's a hat light. Okay, so our first question. I'm really enjoying these videos, Scott Allen Miller. Keep up the good work. Well, I will, thank you. Uh, I will be in Nicaragua with my family this November. I'll be bringing my husband, my mom, and my nine and 11 year old boys. My husband and I went last year, but only stayed in the Matagalpa region for about a week. This time around, I want to visit the coastal area for at least a week, then plan to head to the Matagalpa region again for another week. I'm thinking of renting a house close to a beach. Any recommendations as to which areas might be better for the whole family? We'll be arriving in Managua and be renting a car from there. All right, great. So one, awesome. Already spent time in Madagalpa. It's my favorite. Love it up there. But yeah, there's no beach up there. So there's two different approaches you're going to want to take. One is, do you want to stay around a city and, and just go to the beach? And she said, near to the beach. So I'm thinking that that's probably what's going to make sense. The other option is staying on the beach. Uh, and of course, there are options on many beaches up and down the coast. So that's, that's possible if you want to stay on a beach. So uh, keep in mind that there's the northern beaches, which are very Nicaraguense. That is, they're going to feel more or less like you experienced in Madagalpa. Obviously, beach life is very different than mountain life, but uh, from a, what kind of food do they eat? What kind of lifestyles do they have? Imagine everything in Madagalpa except flat and hot with the sound of rolling surf, and then you pretty much have an idea what they're going to be like. If you go to the southern beaches, that is south of the, the big reserve in the middle of the country, in the Departamento of Rivas, then you're going to explore a completely different uh, culture, right? That is the Costa Esmeralda, and it is predominantly run by expats. It's a whole bunch of enclaves. It's a lot of uh, foreigners coming in to do surfing. It's a lot of the San Juan del Sur and its uh, extension area. So you're, you're loaded with tourists, you're loaded with expats, you're loaded with enclaves, and it gives a totally different vibe. You're also far away from cities. So there isn't any of that, oh, I want to live in a city and go into the beach or live on the beach and go to a city type stuff. There is the city of Rivas, which is perfectly nice, but it's pretty far away from most of the beaches, so it doesn't end up being a really great uh, uh, situation if you want to use the city with any frequency. If you're just going in once every two weeks to do some grocery shopping, it's perfectly fine. But if you want to make it like, a, oh, I want to go out drinking tonight, let's head to a bar in the city. Oh, I got to stay in the city because getting a taxi back is going to be 50 bucks or something, right? Like it's, it's not convenient. So if you want an experience to be in a beach with a city nearby or a city with a beach nearby, Obviously, they're the same place, but you know what I mean. Then you're going to be looking at the Leon beaches. Leon is unique. It is the only city with its own beaches inside its city zone. So if that's something you want, you can easily get a place to stay inside Leon. Obviously, for uh, I think a week, you can just get a house. Airbnbs, they're few and far between, but they do exist. Uh, you know, uh, you could probably get by with like a two bedroom or a three bedroom. They will be a struggle. Just be aware that there, there's not a lot of options uh, in Airbnb. So start looking early. Uh, things go go off the market very quickly because there's only two or three, right? So that's that's an area where it's a little bit tough. But if you're going to stay in a hotel, no problem, right? You'll, you'll have no problem at all. November is part of the slow season, so you will be in decent shape, right? You're not going to be coming in and having everything sold out. 
once you get December, things start to change because of the holiday season. We don't get a lot of tourists from the outside in December, but Nicaraguans start moving around the country for holiday stuff and seeing family and, and uh, religious events and such. So we see a lot of people doing things in December, but October and November have a tendency to be super slow because it's kind of the lead up to the holidays and it's people are saving and preparing for Christmas and it's very rainy, especially in October. So you really just have a lot less going out. Not that people don't go out, but it's if there's going to be a time when they pull back, October and April are really the pullback months. They both are hedging against holidays. April's just after one and is the hot weather right after the holiday season and everybody's out of money. And then October is just before the holiday season and everybody's saving up, right? So it kind of works out that way. So you're probably okay from that perspective. Um, but Leon, you can stay in the city and you can take the bus or taxi out to the beach. Not a big deal. You can also stay in one of the, the two Leon beaches, which are Ponoloya, which is the older, more traditional beach. And you will definitely feel like old school Nicaragua there. Or Las Pinitas, which is definitely not going to make you not feel like Nicaragua, but it is a lot more modern. You're going to have some expats there. You're going to have some like modern restaurants and, and hotels. Like you just have a few more options. And Ponoloya, you're going to be like, oh, where do I even eat? And then all the way down at the end, there's a little cluster of old ranchos. Are they just serving Nicaraguan fare or Salvadoran? There is a Salvadoran restaurant down there. So you can get pupusas. But if you're looking for more variety, Las Peditas is going to be a completely different animal. That's where you're going to have a Polish restaurant, an Italian restaurant, a uh, Spanish Peruvian fusion restaurant, a uh, steakhouse, draft beers, um, <clears throat> Uh, Caribbean themed uh, hostels, regular hostels, the big party like San Juan del Sur, uh, some, some old Nicaraguan stuff, but also some more modern stuff and, and a lot of different places to stay. So it's a completely different vibe. Um, and, but both of those are equidistant from Leon. So you can stay on the beach and easily go into the city and explore the area or stay in the city and go to the beaches. If you're looking at less of having a city nearby and you just want to stay on the beach, then you actually have a lot of options. Everything from the Carrasso zone in the south all the way to the Chinandega zone in the north, those beaches all the way along, because you're gonna have a, a rental car, so you can go anywhere. Uh, most of those, there's a few like Salinas Grandes where even a rental, you kind of don't want to take it down that road in most cases, unless you're renting a four by four. But for most of them, uh, you can just drive out to the beach. So it could be Valero, it could be uh, Miramar, it could be Hermosa, it could be uh, um, Pojamil, it could be uh, you know, just everywhere, right? No, no matter where you go, the whole coast is going to have these little um, villages. And so just look for one that is, you know, definitely targeting uh, uh, families staying. There are a few places that are like fishing villages and just really don't have any infrastructure. Avoid those, right? Don't get the impression because you haven't been to the beach yet. It's easy to get the impression that there's like big built up beaches that are full of resort stuff. There are, but they're enclaves only of beaches that are open to the public that are just normal beaches, they're all very small. San Juan del Sur is kind of an exception, but even it is only kind of an exception. Uh, you're not going to find places that are like high rises, nothing like that. Everything is going to be small. So for a family to investigate, you pretty much can go anywhere. They're all going to be relatively similar. You don't want to avoid the more built up ones because Las Panitas being the most built up one of the entire northern coast, only has so much to do. It's still, you're going to be like, oh, this is very rural, very small town, very tiny, very quiet most of the time. You'll probably appreciate having as much as possible. In a week, you will exhaust the restaurants, right? <laughs> you go to one each night for dinner. That's all of them. And you'll probably go to some twice. Uh, so you, you just be prepared that that's kind of the way uh, to go. But really, you can just look and see what's interesting to you. And if you have further questions as to which ones you might like based on different factors, you know, post another question. Or for anyone who has questions, get down there in those comments, ask away. That's how I get a lot of the content for the show or the topics for the show to provide the content. And of course, there's information down in the show notes for how to send in a video uh, uh, question. And then I can actually pop you on the show and respond to the video. People love that. We don't get it very often. It's really fun when people do. Okay, so I think that answers as best I can what you have there. Um, you really have a lot of options. I would recommend if you like Matagalpa, if that is what you're, you're kind of growing out from, then the northern beaches are what's going to make sense. The southern beaches won't make sense for you, I assume, based on, based on that. Um, and, and of course, if you live here, Visiting southern beaches, nice and easy. If you're going to live here, though, uh, you generally want to live in the north if that's what you like, is, is the Nicaraguan feel. You want to be in the north where the cost is lower, crime is lower, uh, you get the more Nicaraguan experience, uh, and you avoid the enclaves. And as we know, enclaves provide a lot of danger. 
right, not, not just violence, but you're just at a lot more risk for things, it's generally good to avoid enclaves in most cases as a place to live. Visiting doesn't matter. Next question is up. Hey, Scott, I was born in Nicaragua. I left in the early 80s. I'm a U.S. citizen, presumably dual citizen. Uh, but every time I go for vacation, I feel out of place. I do feel I want to retire where I was born. Can you give me some points on how I can buy a house and feel like I belong? How do you do it? So this is obviously tough. Having been away for most of your life, you're basically an American. And while you have Nicaraguan ancestry and heritage and citizenship, I assume, uh, it, it does make it difficult. You will be seen probably forever as a gringo, but there's a lot you can do. So first of all, Nicaragua is not super oil and water with gringos. It is not this like they're over here and we're over here and we don't get along. It's not like that, right? There are some places like that. France, for example. But <laughs> in Nicaragua, if you're becoming part of a community, now obviously when you're a tourist and you're just coming in for the weekend or, or a week, yeah, you're going to feel that like you're a tourist, it is what it is, because you are a tourist, even though you were born here. Yeah, like it, it's true. So that's going to happen. But uh, you don't have to worry too much about Nicaragua. Now, obviously, one of the things you need to do to have that feeling is to avoid the enclaves. And not that you would go to them, but for people who are wondering, going to enclaves creates this from the other side, right? That is when the, the immigrants are like, no, I want to stay separate. And that's okay if that's the thing you want, but it comes with risks. And one of those risks, which is not a not a safety risk, but one of those risks is you'll never feel a part of the community. I don't know anyone who lives in an enclave and feels like they're part of Nicaragua. They always feel like a long-term visitor and like they're, they're on the outside looking in. And for the most part, that's what they want. Being in the enclave, Nicaraguans kind of see them as themselves as being on the outside and looking into the enclave. So it goes both directions. But if you're going to live in the majority of Nicaragua, you're going to live in real communities. One of the things that I do this is not necessary, but it does really help as I live in one of the real barrios. And by real barrios, I mean, there's basically no expats here. Nobody talks about it as a destination. Um, it's, it's on the, in, in my case, it's on the rougher side of, of Leon. And by living here, one, all my neighbors are like, look, this is a unique situation. Cool. There's someone here from somewhere else. Like, that's just, I'm just interesting. They're not like, oh, it's another one of those foreigners. It's nothing like that at all. There's so few foreigners here that unless you clump together, you don't have that like us and them thing. So by avoiding the beach and avoiding the enclaves uh, and avoiding the center of the city with expensive housing where foreigners are just snapping it up because they can afford it and locals can't. And then, then you end up being isolated in those different places. But the majority of Nicaragua, whether it's rural, small village, small city, or barrios of the big cities, you're going to be just in amongst Nicaraguans. And so you will start doing things naturally that just make sense to integrate yourself, right? You're going to end up with local friends. You're going to end up hanging out with your neighbors. You're going to end up shopping at the local markets and such. Yes, you'll probably always go to La Colonia and a few other places. But you know what? When I go to La Colonia, I don't see very many expats in there, more than other places, but not really that many. It's not this like enclave shopping experience the way that people often portray it. They, they're like, it's so expensive, Nicaraguans don't shop there. Try going there sometime. It is almost, I can go for a week every day and never run into a foreigner. Sometimes I run into foreigners, but not on average. Um, uh, in, and like when I tell people, right, I walk around the city, you guys see me doing walk arounds, right? I end up in, in some place and someone stops me and they're like, ah, you, you live in Nicaragua? Yes, I live in Nicaragua. I've lived here for a long time. Oh, okay. And then they immediately go to, do you live in an enclave? Do you live in the center? They're like, you live in, you know, downtown Leon and like some fan. I'm like, no, no, no. I live in Sutiaba. And instantly their face changes. Like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You're Nicaraguan. Cool. And then it's a completely different thing. They were unfriendly before, but they're more like, you're a tourist and you're interesting. So they'll talk to you, but you're still this outsider. And when they find out you live in a real barrio, Guadalupe, Saragossa, if you know the name of your barrio, right, points to you. Uh, William Fonseca, Providencia, uh, you know, we can go on and on. Calvarito, all these places where uh, very few tourists, very few expats ever go. The people are definitely not visiting. Maybe one expat lives somewhere. I've been in Saragossa and someone's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like on this other street, there's one lady who, right? And you're like, okay, I am not in an, in an enclave. There, yeah, there's one lady who thought the same thing as me and lives in this place, right? Eros and Martires of anywhere. Any place with Ero, Eroes and Martires in the name, probably no foreigners. So all those kinds of places, look for those. You'll be totally welcome. One, you're gonna be welcome even if you weren't Nicaraguense. You are Nicaraguense say just a gringo nicaraguense so 
the chances that you're going to have problems fitting in, very low. And presumably you speak Spanish, hopefully, that'll make it super easy as well. If you don't speak Spanish, you get to work on that. The more you speak, by far, the easier you will integrate. I'm assuming you do and, and you know, look and sound and everything like Nicaraguan just uh, just have been away too long that, that it feels uh, like you're a tourist. Once you do that, that, you know, find a neighborhood, obviously, that, that you feel you can fit into. Start looking around to buy. Buy a place like other Nicaraguans, right? Like, that's huge. Um, all the places that I live are in, in amongst Nicaraguans. I'm not by, um, I don't think I have a single expat neighbor anywhere. That I, that I stay anywhere that I visit, anywhere that I rent, nothing, because I have, I have several properties. All of them are completely uh, uh, neighboring other uh, Nicaraguense, uh, I should say. That's, I guess that's not entirely true. Some of the places I have in resort areas are only partially. It, there are some, some expats nearby, uh, but th I'm surrounded by, right? I'm, I'm not in an enclave area. At most, it's one more building. Um, that has someone, uh, but most of them, it's a hundred percent in the barrios, in, in the neighborhoods. And I think it'll naturally come very quickly, right? Try to live a life like Nicaraguans and you will be accepted into it. There's very little of this trying to keep people out kind of thing. And of course we find ways to go out. We, you know, we, we go eat at local restaurants. We go out with friends who are local and do local activities like live bands or just whatever. And uh, yeah, it's going to take a little bit of time. You know, you're coming for vacation or holidays or whatever. So when you come and visit, <clears throat> You know, you're, you're in that vacation mode and that's natural. It's going to keep you apart when you live here full time and, and like people see you week after week, it's going to change very quickly. I go out to the bar and just people that I see all the time, come up, shake my hand, say hi. I could go hang out with them. Like there's just a camaraderie to, oh, yeah, you're clearly a part of the community. So now we're welcoming you in when you're a newbie. Yeah. People might talk to you, but it's out of interest, not out of community building. But once they see you all the time, it's going to start turning into community building. Nicaraguans love their communities and become a part of it, you'll naturally start to fit in. I don't think it's going to be a hard thing for you, especially once you buy a house, uh, you hire someone, you start doing stuff to like, you know, upgrade your community, you know, be a part of things, start shopping places, start to get to know the local people. It's going to be easy. It really is. Um, just avoid those enclaves um, and maybe avoid like Granada. But if you're in, you know, Managua, Masaya, Leon, Matagalpa, Esteli, Hinodega, any of those kinds of places, um, or their suburbs, or the small towns, right? Maybe maybe your family's from some small village, somewhere you're from El Viejo, you're going to move back to the, the small place where you have some family or people remember you, right? Like, that will help as well. Then it'll be like, oh yeah, this house over there, that was my uncle's house, you know, 50 years ago. And some someone who's older is going to be like, oh, I remember your uncle and blah, 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 right? That kind of stuff. And, you know, I've noticed I have local friends who've grown up here, always lived here. And, uh, you know, when I'm hanging out with them, suddenly people are like, oh, oh, this is your friend. Oh, we all know him from elementary school. Oh, you're hanging out with him. Oh, you're family now, right? And it's like a completely different thing. Uh, so all those little things, they just build. So, I mean, Assume it's going to take you probably about a year, year and a half of living here and really doing stuff to really have that feeling, but that's not that long. If you're shopping for a house, find a house, getting a house built, starting to move in, people are going to be taking an interest. Oh, what are you doing? Why are you moving here? Oh, I'm from here. I'm just moving back. Oh, fantastic, right? And then, then you'll be interesting because you've been away, but you'll also be, you know, part of the neighborhood because you are. Uh, so I don't think it'll be a big problem, um, but because uh, even as a foreigner, Right, just making a point of wanting to be uh, a part of Nicaraguan society is all that it took. It took very little time and very little effort. I didn't speak Spanish when we came. I mean, I knew some words, right? Like I could, I could order food and stuff, but I couldn't carry on a conversation. I was not conversational when we moved. Uh, my wife was not conversational. We have no familial ties uh, to Nicaragua. We have no legal ties to Nicaragua when we came. Um, you know, we, we had visited, we had spent time, we had invested. So all those things are positives, but they, they do very little for being ingratiated into a community. People like it, but it, it doesn't do anything really. Uh, so when we came three and a half years ago, we basically were at, at starting point. Uh, very little Spanish and very little everything. And, and we made some, some missteps in trying to integrate, right? We lived on a beach when we first came. That doesn't help, right? Get into the city, get into the barrio. Once we moved into Laborio, uh, which is one of the inner city barrios in Leon, things just accelerated really quickly. Uh, we got to know neighbors and, and all kinds of friends and started going out and just becoming a part of the community, the larger community, and it got really smooth really quickly. Uh, so I would say it only took 
With the year on the beach being not very useful, only about six months of living in the city proper and, and in the barrio. And uh, we felt very much a welcome part of society. Of course, we're still to some degree on the outside, but we're more inside than we are outside. And, uh, you know, the other day we had an accident on the road. I ran out and helped direct traffic, right? We, we're the ones who called for the police. We're the ones who got in front of cars and stopped them on the road. We're the ones who directed people around and knew the neighborhood to tell people where to uh, take detours and such, right? get to be a part of your community, get involved, go to parades, go to festivals, go to the circus. I've never actually done that. Go eat at the street food places, right? Just do stuff. It's going to get, it's going to get very smooth very quickly. I don't think you have anything to worry about. All right, our last topic. Excellent info as always. I am confused a bit still about keeping your phone number for third-party verification for credit cards, etc. If you change physical SIM cards, don't you get a new number? Maybe people use specific kinds of SIMs. Maybe you just have to have an international plan. Thanks. Okay, so this is, yes, if you still have, and you probably will, so this is the, the majority. I am one of these people. If you have, uh, in this case, an American number, so just use American to mean, you know, uh, your home country could be Canadian, could be British, whatever. You have an American number that people use to do like third party uh, two factor authentication. You're logging into a website. We have to prove it's you. We're going to send you a text. There you go. Right. So you probably need to maintain that old number at least for quite some time. Some of those you can switch over. Some will never accept the country that you're in. Uh, they're just they're just nationalistic in that way. Some places just don't like where you move to. These are real problems. But so that's something you just kind of have to accept that you probably have to work around. But it's not generally a big deal for me. So there's a couple different things here. One is if you have an Apple device, which can be a pain if you're moving to Nicaragua specifically. This question is generic. But if you're coming to Nicaragua, Apple devices are hard to get here. But you can certainly get them. But there's no Apple store here. There's no Apple store in a bordering country. There's no Apple store in a country that borders any of the bordering countries for real. We talked to Apple about this and they agreed we are the place farthest from Apple support in the world. There is no country like Nicaragua on earth that is so separate from the direct support of Apple. So while I'm a big fan of Apple, especially with their phones and iPads and to a lesser degree, their laptops and desktops, but I've kind from a hardware perspective, they're the best. From a software perspective, they're pretty weak. But they're not bad. They're definitely better than Windows. But that's not a comparison, right? Good is Linux. OK is Mac. Bad is Windows. From a hardware perspective, Macs are the best right now. The new Samsung uh, Snapdragon-based uh, they're not PCs. They can't be a PC if they have a Snapdragon, but what people call PCs incorrectly from uh, that you're able to run Windows and Linux on are probably going to be pretty good, um, uh, but we'll see, right? We're going to see where those go. That, that's kind of new, but they, they're copying to quite some degree the Apple stuff. Uh, AMD-based PCs, really good hardware, right? There's good stuff in different areas, um, but when it comes to phones, I use iPhones because I get way more power, better support, and I'm willing to fly back to the United States to pick them up and deal with them. It's just worth it to me to have a better device, and it causes me to have no problems, other than needing to fly to the US for every little thing. Totally, totally the way to go. It makes every day that much better. It has eSIMs, so you can put unlimited SIMs in your device. Problem solved. If you have any kind of serious phone that isn't an iPhone and doesn't use eSIMs, although I think more and more are using eSIMs, that's the future. Like physical SIMs are stupid. So eSIMs are definitely the way that people are moving, especially as Apple only supports them, at least in most major markets. But if you need to use physical SIMs, then for the last 15 years or so, quite a long time, there have been multi-SIM phones. You can put more than one physical SIM into the phone. Now that is ideal because you can have one for your, your stable. For me, there's I always have one from T-Mobile. They're my, my home market. Now mine's an eSIM, but I always have my T-Mobile in there. And then I always have one from my uh, local market. Now currently, I'm actually on an e, one eSIM and one physical SIM because my phone can do that, I need to convert my, my one into an eSIM. I just have been lazy because I don't need and I don't need to change anything for any reason. Uh, but so I always have my American number and my uh, Nicaraguan number. So anyone who needs to text me from the US, they can. Anyone who needs to text me from Nicaragua, no one has ever needed to do that. But if they did, they can. I do, however, use my Nicaraguan number for Google verifications because they, they they don't have any of those like, oh, we don't do business with that country kind of policies. Uh, so you can have a phone number anywhere with Google. So for example, if you need to do a YouTube verification, which you have to do as just part of the Google course of events uh, as a creator, 
you can use a Nicaraguan number, no problem. Works just as well as your American one. So a lot of your services, you could switch over to that. Eventually, you could eliminate your American number in theory, but maybe not. Depends on what services you use. Phase those out that don't let you, if you want. Um, but you can have both. Even if you're using physical SIMs, the assumption is that all good phones have multiple SIM card slots if they haven't gone to eSIM. Of those that have gone to eSIM, some have a physical slot that you put it in, convert it to eSIM, and then pop it out. Uh, so those are the processes that work. If you have an old-fashioned or super low-end Android phone, and it only takes a single physical SIM, now you're in a tough position. You have two choices. One is to just pop SIMs in and out. This is what people have done for decades. This is how the entire world outside of North America has dealt with phones before the advent of eSIMs and international plans. So that was the old-fashioned way, but it works, and that's what people have always done. So you need to get that. Just switch out your SIM card, switch which number is on at that moment. It works. Uh, the other thing you can do is have two phones. Now, for this, you can't bring two phones in the country. You have to bring in your American one and just buy a Nicaraguan here. Even new phones for secondary purposes like that are super cheap. Now, of course, if you're living here, you want your good phone to be the Nicaraguan. So switch your SIMs around, put your, your, Nicarag your, your American SIM in some phone that's just there for, for third-party uh, uh, two-factor authentication or for emergency backup or whatever, and then have a nice, nicer uh, Android phone for, for Nicaragua that has your nice camera and all the, you know, that you're going to use your internet on and stuff because you're going to have the good, fast internet here. Those are basically your options. Uh, my personal thing is if you're, if you're able to go back to the U.S., if you're ever going to visit the U.S. again, if you have someone who will ship things to you, just go to Apple and solve all your problems. This is a case where Apple is so far ahead of everyone else that it just makes life as a traveler and an expat easy. And there's very little value to working around it. You're going to spend so much money avoiding Apple. It's just not worth it. Android is not that much of a premium to be, you know, throwing money around like that. Um, but if you just have no means of dealing with Apple products, then then uh, uh, I recommend coming here and just buying good Androids because we have much better Android products here. We have vendors like Xiaomi and Honor that you can't really get reasonably in the United States and North America. That's why American phones are so expensive and have so many problems. They have low-end vendors charging arms and arm and a leg. Terrible. Like vendors you would never really see people use here. I do see some, but they're mostly like, you know, used phones that someone left behind. Um, things that Americans think are good phones are a laughingstock around the world. Like Samsung? Like, I don't know any phone as bad as a Samsung. Worst manufacturing, worst features. It's terrible. And it's high cost, as if you were buying a premium phone. But if you come to the rest of the world, we have much better phones that are much cheaper. So don't buy in the United States. If you're going to be on Android, come here and take advantage of the better market. If you're, but I do recommend uh, iPhones heavily because they do solve a lot of problems. But I have friends on Xiaomi who love them. So if I had to be on, on Android, I would buy a Xiaomi, no question. Huawei would be a decent choice, but Xiaomi is so good because I do a lot of photography. Their camera stuff is the best. Man, Samsung is famously the worst to the point where they don't even do real photos. They actually give you like paste in stuff sometimes. Like they've just given up on having a good camera and have gone to totally gimmick based stuff. Um, it's, it's so bad. So I once made the mistake of buying a Samsung phone. I won't buy any product from Samsung or LG or Hyundai ever again. Worst companies ever. All of them just hate their customers and, and just, I feel like their products are a practical joke. Like, you would not believe the things we can get people to buy from us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's bad. So those are the ways to handle it. One way or another, yes, your SIM card is tied to your number, but most people are not tied to a single SIM card. So that's why that is not seen as a broad problem. Thanks for joining me, everybody. Like and subscribe. Get down and ask your own questions. I'd love to see them. Uh, thanks for hanging out as I have bronchitis. Uh, and uh, if you would like to support the channel, the work that we do here, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. I am heading to the city of cafes, so I would really appreciate having some coffee to drink. That would be fantastic. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you all tomorrow.